Hello, thank you uh, very much, uh, everyone, uh, for, for joining in person. Um, and those of you online, thanks very much. And, and uh, sorry for uh, taxing your patience uh, with a slightly late start, uh, but we will uh, get going and I'll try and say as little as possible. I'm Charles Kenny from the Centre for Global Development. Uh, again, thanks for joining us for this uh, book talk. Uh, um, we have uh, uh, Liz and Stefan um, and Peter here. Um, so we have uh, 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 the three main authors. Um, we also, um, and I'm delighted to say we have uh, Rosendulu here, uh, who is um, uh, 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 one of Benno's grandchildren. And, and uh, she will say a few words to uh, open up. Uh, then we will have uh, uh, Liz and then Stefan. Uh, uh, speak for uh, 20 or so, 25 minutes. Um, and then, and thank you, uh, Shanta, uh, Shanta Devarajan, uh, now at, at, at Georgetown next of uh, the World Bank, uh, to provide uh, some comments. And then we'll um, open up for discussion. Much looking forward to it. And with no further ado, uh, Rose. So thank you all for being here today. Thank you to Elizabeth and the team at Pathways for Prosperity Commission and the Digital Pathways of, at Oxford for inviting me to say a few words today. And thank you for, uh, to the Center for Global uh, Development for hosting this lovely book launch. So Benno would have truly loved to be here today. He genuinely enjoyed every single trip to Oxford and he'd always come back so full of energy. He was always eager to get back into his office after a long trip and rest was never ever in Benno's vocabulary. He never really considered any of this work though. It was his passion and his mission. And that says so much about who he was and what this book meant to him. He was so many things to so many people, a friend, mentor, colleague, scholar, grandpa. He was someone you could depend on no matter what the role was. Throughout his career, he has broken ground on some of the most innovative policy approaches to extending the financial system to the unbanked. He observed that you couldn't have effective monetary policies or implementation if the majority of your population was not using formal financial services. He strongly believed that fintechs played a significant role in bridging that gap to boost financial inclusion and economic growth for a developing country. In the case of Tanzania and during his time as central bank governor, he identified that mobile money service providers were crucial in enhancing access and usage of financial services amongst the unbanked population, and that the development of these providers had made it possible for millions of Tanzanians to have greater access to financial services. He was also keen to allowing other business innovations, such as agent banking activities and platforms to operate in the country. And even then, he still was uh, keen on having technology be applied in the agent banking platform. Uh, platform. So in Benno's own words, Tanzania's strategy to achieve universal financial inclusion will continue to be digitally driven. So after retiring uh, from the Bank of Tanzania in 2018, Benno's mission in developing a financially inclusive system in Africa still was not over. He had so much knowledge to share still and so much to do. In 2019, he co-founded FINSYS, which he actively chaired until his passing in 2021. So through FINSYS, he wanted to establish a financially inclusive system that left no one behind, and that such systems should be vibrant, convenient, efficient, and positively impact African livelihoods, including women and youth. Benno envisioned that focus would need to be placed in the development of optimal cross-border payment arrangements to give effect to the African Continental Free Trade Agreement that seeks to improve and harmonize trade on the continent. Benno accomplished so much in his career, and he left behind an incredible legacy. He's missed by many, and I just know that having you all here at the launch of the book that he, Elizabeth, Stefan, and Peter worked on um, would have meant so much to him. Thank you. Thank you. Um, that was that was lovely. Uh, uh, Liz, over to you. Thanks so much, Charles. Thank you so much for that, Rachel. What a lovely way to open this event. Um, very touching words uh, as we remember Benno. And thank you so much to Charles and to CGD for hosting the event for us too. Um, I'm going to talk about four things. I'm going to talk about why we wrote the book, uh, what the book's about, essentially. Uh, what went right in the work that the book describes? So kind of what worked and then also essentially what didn't work, what was less successful. Obviously that's always the most uh, interesting part of uh, any discussion like this. And we've, we've tried to be clear eyed about it. Um, I, I would say that we have um, 
very strong ties of kind of emotional affection to this work, largely because of Benno, because it was led by Benno. Um, and we have uh, profited from the fourth author of the book being was who wasn't directly involved in the work that it describes, um, Peter Knack, down the end of the table, who uh, held our feet to the fire and made sure that we were uh, relatively clear-eyed about the way in which we described the works. But um, I think, so we, we've tried to be honest. Let me, let me put it that way. So first of all, why did we write the book? I mean, most simply, the, the first answer is to honour Benno. Um, this was, actually, he passed away. We talked about writing a book. We talked about capturing the lessons from the work. Um, but he had passed away by the time we started writing the book. But listing him as lead author is anything but artistic license. This was absolutely the work that it described was absolutely his intellectual baby, his intellectual brainchild, and could have not have happened in the way in which it happened without him, without his, not just his vision, but without the part, the role in which he played. The fact that we were able as a team to pick up the phone to, frankly, any African policymaker and some policymakers in non outside the subcontinent, outside the continent as well, and talk to them about why we thought this work might be valuable and useful for them. And they took it seriously because Benno, it was Benno on the other uh, on the other end of the line talking to them about it. So uh, the book is to honour him. Um, he was, he was without wanting to put words in his mouth, he was really genuinely convinced about the potential of digital transformation. Um, he admitted to me, I don't know if he told you this or maybe you, Shanta. Shanta was one of our um, commissioners, I'll explain his role in a minute, uh, that when we started this work, he wasn't, he was, nah, he wasn't so convinced. He was like, you know, yes, the fourth industrial revolution, yeah, 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 it's another silver bullet come along to kind of, you know, save all countries. By halfway through, he was utterly committed. Not about leapfrogging, not the leapfrog uh, kind of... Uh, a trope, but that with careful planning and a careful strategic approach that countries were able to get ahead of this and already identify what they wanted and what they needed and therefore how digital technologies could deliver the kind of economic pathways that they, that they, um, where they needed to progress. So capturing, uh, capturing those lessons were, were really important. So that's the other purpose of the book. First is honouring Benno, second is capturing the lessons. Um, like I've said, we tried to do so in a fairly clear-eyed way. It's not an evaluation. Um, it's in, it's the kind of, uh, Robert Schiller would have recognised it as narrative economics, let's put it that way. I won't, I certainly won't call it journalistic, but it was, a, it was, a, the work finished in 2021. So we had, you know, a recent memory, we were able to quite quickly and rapidly capture impressions and the lessons that had been learned. And, and this is why we wanted to set these down. Right. So what is the book? Having said that, what's the book about? It's about um, our joint work in seven developing emerging economies uh, in a bid to support efforts to identify their own digital comparative advantage. Um, the work took place between 2018 and, as I said, we finished in 2021, and we worked in seven countries. We piloted the work in South Africa, Mongolia, and Ethiopia, fairly random selection of countries. Um, I mean that in a non-economic sense, random. I mean in a random sense of uh, not three countries that you would normally see grouped together, let's put it that way. We then went on to uh, do the work in uh, Bangladesh, in Malawi, in Lesotho, and then a seventh country, which we choose not to name in the book. And the reason why is because, frankly, it all went pear-shaped. It all, this, you know, talking about what went wrong, this is the country where lots of things went wrong. And we thought it on, on balance, it was better to try and capture honestly what went wrong and why, an assessment of why it went wrong, um, in a way that didn't embarrass anyone rather than trying to kind of couch things um, in terms that, you know, people would feel more comfortable with them, but we would have the transparency of identifying which country. So there's a mystery country in there as well. Let me put it that way. Um, and this work was a product of something that was called the Pathways for Prosperity Commission. This was a two year Gates funded commission. Melinda Gates was our co-chair. Uh, Shanta was one of our commissioners. Uh, Stefan was the co-academic director, Benno was the other co-academic director, I was the executive director, 
Um, and it was an effort to try and work that was really cutting edge at the time, think about how developing countries could do this, exactly this, kind of identify and manage their own interests in the sort of swirl of, at that time, panic swirl of technology is kind of, you know, launching itself upon countries. There were figures flying around of, you know, 70% of jobs in Ethiopia were going to be automated. What do we do? What do we do about all the, you know, the regulatory issues that present themselves with this? How do we get ahead of this, you know, whirlwind and deal with it? And we, you know, as all fine commissions do, we wrote a bunch of excellent, shall I say, reports um, that had a lot of influence. They influenced the bank, the World Bank strategy on um, on digital transformation, FCDO, the AU strategy, UNDP strategy, the Broadband Commission. But Benno said, this isn't good enough, right? We're not going to just write a bunch of reports that, that you know, have, a, have some influence, but then sit on a shelf gathering dust somewhere. We need to, both for the reasons of legitimacy, we can't be talking about how digital transformation is going to work in countries if we haven't done some, you know, tried to get our hands dirty and get involved with some of it ourselves. But also we want something useful, a legacy of this, this two-year project uh, that policymakers can pick up and use in, you know, now and in, and in times to come. So uh, that's what the work is. This, this toolkit that was developed was called, we called it the Digital Economy Kit. And it's the implementation of sort of attempts to implement this kit that the book that the book described. Now, I think the interesting question, and it's worth um, spending just a little bit of time reflecting on this, is why on earth did developing country policymakers want to do this? Aside from the very serious point about because it was Benno suggesting that this might be useful for them, you know, diagnostics, oh, sorry, I should also backtrack and say what, very briefly, what the digital economy kit is, if you want to know, the book doesn't, the book doesn't uh, set out the kit, the kit's all online, but uh, the book describes the process, which was a diagnostic, very simple, a diagnostic, a multi-stakeholder dialogue, uh, and a strategy primer. We weren't writing policy for countries. Benno was very clear on that. We were suggesting some prioritized actions that uh, were a result that had been identified by this process, this country-owned, country-led, country-driven process, uh, which would then ideally be taken up into national policymaking processes. Um, and the diagnostic was looking at four areas. It was looking at infrastructure, hard and soft. It was looking at finance. It was looking at policy and regulation. And it was looking at um, digital skills, so people. So I asked the question, you know, why should a policymaker take this seriously? The, the, the question is, again, a really serious one, because not only are diagnostics a dime a dozen, digital diagnostics, even at that time, were, you know, we were not the only game in town by any means. UNDP had one, UNCDF had one, UNCTAD had one, Dahlberg had one. And very significantly, the bank had more than one. And in three, and not only did they have one, in three of the seven countries where we were working, the bank had already done its own digital diagnostic process. And yet the policymakers still came to us and said, we want to do your process, even though we've just gone through it with the bank or we're about to go through it with the bank. So that's quite that's quite notable, I think. And when we asked, when we were writing the book and asking the policymakers, it's quite rich in policymaker voice uh, in the book. You know, why? Why did why did you do this? A couple of answers. One was, it's because this was a this was a process about the country's own interests, right? The bank does a digital diagnostic. The bank's diagnostics were good. Um, they asked us to partner with them in Ghana. We 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 declined. But you know, we had we had some shared interest in this, but the bank was doing it because it wanted to figure out where it should be, you know, how it should form its own lending portfolio, right? This was a kind of, how should the bank invest? Our process was about what does the country need? What does the, what do policymakers want to do themselves? So the first one was kind of intent. Um, the second reason why it was identified as being different was it was really simple. It was not some kind of fancy, you know, 150 page, um, you know, document with flow charts and really nice graphics. The original version of it was seven slides long, right? By the time the methodology evolved a bit and it was a bit more complex, but Benno insisted this is, has to be usable, right? This has to be simple. Um, we need to do the thinking, we need to do the hard work for the policymakers and make it this as simple as possible. Um, and Anir Chaudhry, whose um, who's, who's voice is in the book quite a lot, he's the director, policy director for A2I, which is the digital agency of Bangladesh, he said, you know, I was really surprised when I saw it. 
it's written by Oxford. I thought it was going to be full of theories, right? And actually, it's really usable. And boy, did he need something usable because the national ICT strategy that had come out the year before for Bangladesh had 343 unprioritized action items in it. So he was thrilled to have something that was, you know, short and sharp and succinct. Um, Miriam Said, who is the digital advisor to the uh, to Prime Minister Abe in Ethiopia, said she liked it because Abe wanted quick wins. Right? He didn't want to wait until you'd had all the hard infrastructure development. Uh, t- uh, telecoms liberalization had been pre-announced. He wanted, and he said to her, I want something announceable. I want something doable or announceable. Um, and it gave him what he wanted. So this kind of this, this, was, this was delivering for policymakers what they needed. And then the third reason was, I mean, I, I, I say that it was, it was a simple tool to use. There was sophisticated thinking behind it because it was built on the years of Benno's experience, Benno and others, including Shanta, you know, years of, you know, grappling with the vicissitudes of policymaking in more or less complex environments. And so actually the political economy design of it hatred of that term aside, Stefan, I'll, I'll, I can indulge myself and use it. Um, you know, he, he had thought long and hard about how this was going to work, but it was, it was about the people. It wasn't about, you know, sort of very difficult, um, you know, economically complex or sophisticated tool that was going to be used. It was a tool designed to get the right people in the room thinking about this. And really important to this was anchoring it high. So in every country where we worked, we had the process was sponsored either by the president or the prime minister. And we had the right policy entrepreneur leading for us. So we had the cabinet, sec- the former cabinet secretary uh, in Bangladesh. Uh, we had the central bank governor and the chief economic advisor to the prime minister in Lesotho. We had, you know, we had the right people in place to do it. And we had, we had a focus on inclusion and we had Benno. So that's what the book is about. What were the successes? Um, and again, this is where Peter's role in holding our feet to the fire has been really important because I think we were so excited about the successes. And Peter was like, hang on, wait a minute. Lots of these countries, you know, this wasn't, these countries were already starting down the line of digital transformation. It wasn't like, you know, this was the start of anything anywhere. And let's be careful about, you know, attribution versus contribution. And anyway, even when you can see direct kind of policy um, take up of the sometimes, you know, verbatim from the strategy primer, as in the case of Malawi, where Malawi 2063, we were deliberately developing our uh, the, the digital economy kit as a kind of one of the arm, one of the sort of consultative elements of Malawi 2063 as it was being developed. The um, first implementation plan, the MIP, like I say, picks up lots of the language from it. But again, it picks up lots and lots and lots of language. There is there are a large number of, uh, again, unprioritized, prioritized or less prioritized items in the MIP. And it's not completely clear that the government has either the will or the capacity to deliver on all of those. So even when it appears in a policy document, we're not assuming implementation, right? Peter made very sure of that. That said we had extraordinary cut through, really. And it seems like there is some evidence that some of this cut through may endure. Um, I think the biggest area of success that we can point to with the greatest degree of confidence is the coalitions that this process created and very deliberately created. So not just the the very high level um, policymakers who were sponsoring it, but also the people who showed up to the multi-stakeholder dialogues. And this was, it was this element actually of the toolkit that Benno thought about most. He talked about the user needs to be in the room. You need to be able to look the user in the eye as you're thinking about developing strategy. Co- that These processes developed coalitions that look like they may sustain. So in Lesotho, for instance, you've had a change of administration. Fortunately, um, our main interlocutor has now become the central bank governor. He talks about business continuity. He's completely, he's got everything set up to make sure that this has, uh, can endure a regime change in Lesotho and he's working now on implementation. The bank has said, you know, it's really interesting. Now we talk to the government of Lesotho and they know what they want. They come to us with a set of demands around digital transformation. So we know what to fund. Um, In South Africa, we didn't create a coalition. Um, You have the PESA, which is the BPO um, kind of 
sector group. We had Harambi um, uh, Digital uh, Youth Youth Employment Accelerator. We had the DTI and Genesis Analytics, who are our partners. They already work together, but it was working through this process together that they really coalesced around a specific commitment to creating half a million jobs in the BPO sector by 2030, um, a fifth of which would be targeted explicitly at, um, at marginalized youths, so young people from townships explicitly. So it created some coalitions that look like they may last. And that in itself is a good thing. If nothing else is delivered, that is, we think our assessment is it was worth doing, even if nothing else uh, uh, transpires. But some other things did transpire. So in Ethiopia, the digital strategy became the, the Ethiopia's digital strategy. It was signed off by the cabinet office. There was a few bits of Dahlberg work uh, in there as well, but it was primarily uh, the work that Benno and Stefan had led uh, that has now become the strategy and a couple of payment, digital payments, mobile money strategies and directives that direct, that came, you know, you can trace the line. And again, the government traces the line from our process to those appearing in the in uh, digital Ethiopia. You, you can see a direct line. Now, implementation has it, it hasn't happened in every case. It's not the end of the road, but there's clear signs that something good is there. In, in Mongolia, very quick implementation. It was e-government rather than whole of the economy transformation, but we had 181 uh, e-services were launched within six months. So that's pretty, pretty impressive. Briefly then on things that went wrong. And then Stefan's going to talk some more about the lessons from what went wrong. So um, we, we thought about implementation, right? We took it seriously. Benno took it really seriously. Even so, we didn't take it, probably didn't take it seriously enough. So the strategy primer, you know, the, 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 the toolkit ends by saying the strategy primer is the end of the digital economy kit, but the start of something broader. That was probably a little bit too nomic. We, and we should have been a little bit more, I think we should have planned more for, okay, how do we know the coalition that's going to take this forward? Is it really there? Have, is it fully enough embedded such that we can now back away and, and, and leave it rightly so to domestic players? And how do we know, like, what point does it need to get to that it's ready that somebody else can then pick it up and implement? And in South Africa and Ethiopia, for instance, we identified, our partners identified that you needed an additional process to literally, you know, somebody's name needs to be next to implementing each of the action points. Otherwise, it's not going to happen. A budget line needs to be, you know, written against it as well. Again, otherwise it's not going to happen. So we just we just needed to be more careful. Although the, the 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 idea of leaving it to the country to implement was completely right. We just need to be a little bit more careful about it. And then, you know, did we get the right country? And every time we were always demand driven. The country were where it went wrong. The donor was actually probably a little bit more involved in trying to push this along. But we felt we'd read the runes correctly. The president wanted it. Um, the president had a digital advisor. Um, still, you know, I don't think we'd read the political economy of the country correctly. And in Malawi, the verdict may be out. Implementation probably looks like it's weakest there, least likely to happen. I'll leave Ben. I'll leave Stefan to talk about Malawi. Oh, yes. Okay, good. Um, oops. Yeah. Um, well, thank you, Liz. And... Um, you know, when, when you do a, um, a piece of work like this, um, you know, the, the, there are days that you focus on the, the glass half full and, and days that you focus on the glass, glass half empty. And so, and, and what I also mean by this is in some of the bits of the work, you know, that we've learned a lot and working with Ben on this, we learned an awful lot. Um, it's very hard in the end to, to make um, persistent claims of how important it has been. But there's a number of things that I want to, and I'll pick up where, 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 where Liz left it, is that you know, what, what is interesting, or what, what we found interesting, and also then trying to get the book together afterwards, is that um, the principle by which Benno tried to design this was really, we need to offer something that can be owned by the country itself. You know, and we you know, I've worked in this aid business uh, for long enough. We use these words all the time. But it's actually when you're done face to say, okay, how do you can design something that actually can be like that? It's actually a, a fascinating challenge. You know, we're kind of saying, you know, what can we offer? And this was uh, eloquently describing some of these things 
that we try it in a bit of design and say, okay, can we offer something that they can use and that possibly then they can embed? And, and I think if we think of anything that is reasonably successful is that there were certain people in several of these countries that were in key positions that seemed to have used it and taken and, and, and felt it helpful and there is something that persists on it. So that I, and, and, I, and, and I want to say, but there was another side to it is that rarely as an academic, you're put in a position where, um, and I thought that was an interesting challenge to actually, oh, now you implement it, you know, you can you can do something and now do do it. And so it um, doing this as, you know, as the World Bank or as DFID at the time, you know, that comes to natural, but you happily leave it to others to try to do this and you can push it on. Here, being put in the position together with Benno in terms of saying, okay, can we actually, the small thing we were doing, uh, can we actually respond to this let me be honest, a bit of donor incentives as well, to actually saying, you know, you better get it a bit implemented, show, show that there is something useful, uh, created something quite interesting because we were forced to think about implementation. And it's so rare that we actually are forced to think about it. And I think that's then the, the second interesting thing. And, and this already came on the conclusion system, you know, you can keep on designing things. And if you don't think about implementation, you know, what are we actually doing while we're designing it? And there is definitely some lessons there. And I'll come back to, 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 to more details. And But then the third thing beyond, you know, being forced to think about, you know, something they can own, forced to think about implementation. From the beginning, there was this sense, um, and, and definitely I was encouraging Benno to say, oh, let's keep notes, let's keep notes in terms of what the experience is of doing these things. You know, this is not going to be an academic evaluation, but rarely we document uh, what actually we're doing. And, um, and then exposed, we, we get stories about how we think we did rather than actually keep keeping the notes. So there is still a bit of that because, you know, we, we don't really have enough notes while we're implementing it, but we definitely tried somehow or another to piece, piece, piece things together. Now, as an academic, this is highly uncomfortable, of course, because, you know, you, you're, you're doing exactly what you're teaching all your, everybody else and able to do, which is doing your evaluations exposed. Um, and so you also end up in this whole thing about attribution contribution. But if you think of it in an intervention language, this is an incredible bundle you're offering. You know, and how could you actually uh, design? And sometimes I'm still struggling with how could we actually have designed something else beyond carefully taking notes of what was going on and actually to say, well, let's actually do, I don't know whether that's a term that exists, a kind of a narrative evaluation to actually document carefully all the things that are happening and then involve someone like Peter Exposed to help us triangulate, talk to all the people that were involved and actually keep them together. So in a way, that's how you should think about the book in a, in a lot of things, to document as much as we can. Okay, there is, a, there is a big exposed part, but actually, you know, what do we think happened and what happened when, why, and how do I now people perceive what had been happening and so on. So all kinds of um, problems uh, in, in terms of, say, as an evaluation. So I never use this. This is not an evaluation of what we did. So documenting, kind of a narrative documenting of what we did. doesn't mean that you can't have a framework. And let me actually, there's, there's three things in the end, or three lenses in which we can see some of the successes, but also the things that went wrong. And for me, increasingly very interested in anything to do with implementation, it's quite helpful to actually kind of, okay, make a very easy, very simple classification uh, around it. But we, we had a bit of a framework when writing this up that we wanted to look at, you know, three things where clearly that clearly were very influential for success and failure, uh, lenses, I mean. And the first one was essentially we are stepping into a bureaucracy. And are we stepping into bureaucratic politics in a country, okay? Um, you know, I was yesterday talking to, to, to someone uh, senior at, um, um, fr from an aid agency and saying, oh, well, you know, whenever a World Bank project goes wrong, it's usually the, the answer is it's government capacity. Now, government capacity means a lot of things. You know, that's the kind of most beautiful word that can be used. <laughs> to describe endless things. And so the first one is clearly, you know, you are as an outsider stepping into um, some kind of bureaucratic politics with a small P, sometimes with a bigger, bigger P. And I just think of it, you know, having been a civil servant, I definitely can reflect on it, is that, you know, 
who you work with and, 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 and how you position yourself is incredibly complicated and difficult. You know, you, you always end up in turf wars. You always end up in fights over budgets. You always end up with people that feel superior over another one. So we have, um, so you, so you have that issue. And on top of that, of course, you're dealing with government where clarity of objectives, it's not its strongest part in any government that is, because it's part of the political game typically to, to have objectives that suit a certain audience and then another objective that suits another one and so on. So the confusion that is there. So there's definitely two countries where we very much hit that, I would say, the bureaucratic politics. So the first one is actually Ethiopia. We, that, that's, the other one is the unnamed one, so we'll come into that in a moment. But uh, the Ethiopia was really interesting because very much in the kind of, um, and this is not out of disrespect, but the relative controlling way they like to run the government and the way the, 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 the um, you know, the, you have a series of, ministries where under the current government technocrats were appointed but of course the political clout of technocrats is much less they may be very able technocratically but it's on purpose that certain ministries are packed sometimes with, with technocrat and we had this here with the ministry of information and technology where everybody said oh that's the one you need to work with now my own instinct was from the beginning oh my god nothing is going to happen if we have pushed in that direction because that means there is none of the the other uh, buy-in but it's it, it was very clear that actually because of that kind of push that we had to actually work with that ministry, you're almost predetermined that actually you couldn't be part of the bigger political, political game or the political economy game that, that is going on. So there was very clear there were certain very deep and fundamental things, and I'll give you one example, which is then... Um, unlike what uh, Njuguna has massively achieved when he was governor of the central bank in Kenya, the, gov the, the central bank here had regulations that essentially made it impossible to actually ever go to proper digital payment systems via, via mobile technology. And so you, you, you would have so supposedly processes going on to say, oh, no, we of course are going to be part of it. But then the detail of the regulation meant that it could never really happen. So you kind of say, look, what are we doing with anything to do with the economy and digital stuff if you can't do digital payments? And in fact, it became one of the big stumbling blocks with the privatization uh, of, of the, the, the license that Safaricom subsequently acquired, because actually, in principle, it wasn't really part of the bundle. You could do mobile phone, but still would have a country where you couldn't quite do this. So you step in that kind of bureaucratic politics. Oh, but you're dealing with them almost as if you can't do it. Now, over time, we learned. And, you know, the relationship ministry of finance are, are pretty good. And so actually, you know, we had to move this work to somewhere else because otherwise there's just no way you can do it. Now, for people who've been involved in implementation and operational work, this sounds all self-evident. It's very striking how you know, the documentation of that is very rare. I can't remember ever reading a paper that actually explains why this would happen like that in Ethiopia. And it's like endless written on, on, on a country like that where you, you want to be aware. Now, I'm not saying it's generalizable. It's Maybe it's time-specific, but it's the documentation of it. Anyway, the good news is that then slowly, by moving the work more towards uh, another part, and in fact, uh, the advisor involved, who was the mint advisor, was moved to the to the prime minister's office. As a result, there is a bigger scope. Although, and if I now move forward to today, the digital ID is now in another ministry, so there is still a kind of an issue of a kind of a battle going on. Where is actually the lead? Because you know it's a bit hard to go and to do the more advanced digital digital stuff if the digital id is not at all linked to any of the other work that's going on and so on so you're sitting there in in that thing so at least we have that in the unnamed country it was almost simpler you know uh we were encouraged to work with a digital advisor it seems of the of the president that sounds like a reasonable thing if you have to work with someone it's the digital advisor of the president Little did we know that the minister was furious that this had happened. And basically everything was done to try to stop all the work that was going on. And so endless confusion was being created. And in the end, you know, nothing really moved. And in the book, we document a little bit about it. And, um, you know, it's, it's the kind of thing, Justin, that one day you will want to say that's the country and then uh, put it there. But we will be long gone out of that country by then. Um, the, but, but it's the kind of, uh, kind of thing. And it's actually, you know, you, you can hit that. You know, you can basically hit someone saying, look, 
over my dead body. This is not going to happen. And then everything within the bureaucratic politics to try to make sure nothing happens. And so in the end, even though there was enthusiasm about this digital advisor, this was considered a turf, turf war and, and nothing will ever happen. So that's, that's one thing. That's bureaucratic politics. The second one was actually very interesting. And I must say, I had initially not thought deeply about it. But on reflection, it's definitely one frame where two of the countries are experienced we could fit into it. And, and it comes to do, you know, we, we consciously wanted, and, and, and Benno and myself are always quite keen, you know, let's not just do it about digital services of the government, but actually try to think about what it can mean in the economy. And there's definitely a couple of the countries we're working in that already slowly where where uh, we're doing a bit of it or at least you would perceive they should be able to do a bit of the kind of export of e-serve of, uh, of 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 outsourcing e-serv so bangladesh and south africa sound like sensible you know we we picked up uh, something that actually some of several of the senior policymakers have never really realized that there was this very active business from durban to give uh, english lessons to china from durban and of course if you think of it you know there are very well educated English is, is very strong, but they're not as expensive of doing it from London. And the time zone is a bit better as well, so you can do it. So there's actually businesses that specialize in, 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 in language uh, training for China and doing this simply online for a long time. And, and, and it probably has boomed further now since then. So it meant in South Africa that actually, you know, thinking about, you know, the challenge and opportunities in the economy an economy that is pretty stuck anyway, and where on most things in, in, in everything in the economy in South Africa feels quite stuck, it felt like after a bit some of these operators, even though, you know, maybe a bit less from the presidency, but then for some of these interested parties, they say, look, this is actually a great opportunity to get a bit of government as, uh, assistance and some attention. There is no big uh, you know, political well, political analysis of the, of the economy in South Africa. You know, things are getting quite stuck often. You know, um, labor and capital very rigid in their ways of operating the economy. But this was a fairly unregulated economy with very different type of players, not with old capital in it. It was much newer capital. So that was actually seen as a much bigger uh, big opportunity. And suddenly you've got that they found themselves because of these special interests saying, well, this is actually a really thing. So they hatched themselves onto it, got much more more attention, got us some more government support. And actually, I'm not saying it has massive thing, but it was essentially a, a coalition of, 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 of players that I say, oh, this is actually our opportunity to do something else and we are less stuck in, the, in, in our own political system. Bangladesh is then another interesting one, which is not featuring very highly in the export of e-services at the moment. And actually, it's a kind of an interesting thing. You know, why would Southern India doing it so well and Bangladesh wouldn't? And it's an interesting thing the more we looked at it because, the, you know, they're doing pretty well. And, uh, you know, Anu Chowdhury was mentioned already. They're doing pretty well of having on government e-services a lot of initiatives. I'm not sure it's the right. And Anu is on the line here. He's just showing up. Uh, and I have to be careful what I say now. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, the, um, but, but, uh, but you know, there is a, there is a lot there. And, it's, and they're not in some sense, relatively speaking, there's not that much going on in that thing, in that, that area. And one of the things we, we, we found very striking, so the private sector response to these digital opportunities is maybe less there. And, you know, we could have long, long analysis, and I'm sure in Q&A, Andy will want to say something. But it's not, not for nothing that if you think of industrial policy in Bangladesh, you know, for some, it's a massive success in terms of getting the garment industry and doing it reasonably not too much support. But now, of course, you could argue that actually the garment industry is actually a blockage. They are now very politically very important. And that means all the economic attention tends to be we need to get the garments going. So there's endless yeah. subsidies in that sector now as well. And you say, well, actually, there's not really that much space and interest of the government to actually support on the other things. Now, is that enough to explain it? But it's quite interesting that uh, at least that's one hypothesis why, why, why in Bangladesh that's not emerging. And definitely, definitely leave Anya to talk about it more later on um, on that. And so there's a third thing. So that's special interest related to the economic things uh, and bureaucratic politics as the first two. The third one is actually where things arguably really are stuck. Okay, so we really are stuck, and you know, um, some of you may be aware I've been writing about elite bargains and things like that. But basically, what we mean by this is actually there is that fundamentally in the whole the way politics, the economy, civil service, and other groups 
are interacting in the nature of the, the implicit deal that they have of how they are running politics and how they're handling it um, means sometimes in practice that very little can actually ever change. You know, and uh, Malawi comes into it, it's always my country of frustration, is that where we're actually, you know, there is endless initiatives from outside. It's probably the, the one country that any researcher ever wants to run an RCT, they can do it because, and my argument is, and I'm sorry that I'm being so frank, because they don't care. So they will sign off on it. And it's just anything is possible in Malawi. Any outsider that comes, I get endless messages from different parts of government that Oxford should support them in things that fundamentally would be inconsistent with each other in terms of civil service reform. There's an endless interest. There is definitely not really a configuration of, of coordinated action to do actually systematically something new. And with our initiative, we ended up more or less in the same quagmire, where you get someone that wants to champion it, but you have very clear that there is within government just very little chance that any coalition is built, built up. We had an entry point, and let me now be careful. Uh, what I say by a particular person, government changes, immediately this person is accused of corruption uh, and used anti-corruption measures as a way of liquidating, the, of liquidating maybe as an exaggeration, uh, of, of neutralizing the political role of this particular person, and so on. So you get this immediate kind of thing where, where, where the game is being played. And actually, you know, in Malawi, did we, ever, did we really achieve it? I had long conversations with Bidbeno, and I remember telling him, you know, look, I burnt my fingers before uh, trying to do things in Malawi. And then I said, well, we still have to try it. They're interested. Let's have a go. And I think that was a, that's, that's you know, the eternal optimist that he also was. And said, look, you know, at some point we need to find things that stick there and, and undoing it. So there's no regrets that we did it. But actually, you know, you know, you you tried your best to have a bit of a sense of who is politically important, how the places are connected. Our entry point was the National Planning Commission. There was an appearance as if that could survive the elections and that could do it. And arguably it has, but maybe it has it in a way that because it is ineffective, it can survive because it is not trying to change anything. And um, and so you, you you have that. So I'm sorry, I'm being frank, we're a bit more careful in the, in, in, in the book. In, and then the final one was Mongolia, which was really fascinating, a very, you know, uh, an interesting place, a small, small population on a vast territory. Of course, digital is already quite important uh, from the moment they can do, they do the things so that you would imagine there's quite a lot of interest. Coming there, actually, it was very striking. First of all, I remember going to meet the, the prime minister, actually, the, and um, they were not aware of anything that was happening on the digital side in the private sector. There was absolutely no joint up, even though we had already by then identified private sector firms who were working from Mongolia mapping mining interests, not just in Mongolia, but also in Australia. So they're providing their services to Australia from Mongolia to doing it. So you say, look, there's something going on here already. They were not quite aware of this. But also within government, they were very keen and say, oh, look, we need to do more digital government services. And again, given the nature of that country, it makes an awful lot of sense. But actually, the traction was quite, quite, quite limited. But what was interesting, now at some point in the book documents that's in more detail, the um, after a few of false starts, hardening it, uh, doing it, it was linked now to actually a real drive for anti-corruption uh, by the latest government, and actually probably in a way that actually has a chance to be a bit more durable because it's actually a very uh, government services on I mean, Mongolia. Unfortunately, is also notoriously uh, problematic in its delivery of government services and very clientelist state. So uh, corruption is definitely a symptom of that. Um, where it actually is now said, no, oh, this is a way for us to clean up certain things. And actually, suddenly, it gave a lot more traction in the kind of uh, democracy that they have in the political space, and it became actually something almost a rally inquiry in politics of actually using these things for, for anti-corruption. So you could actually say, look, it's, it's maybe a mechanism here that I'm not saying it will, but there is an opportunity now to shift a little bit in the nature of the way the state is operating within society and, and, and actually uh, moving in that. So that was another one where it is something different. So anyway, these, these, these experiences, I think it's, it is very interesting. We can only at best document and put it in a, in a framework. But for me, the, 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 the lessons are definitely that it's, it's worthwhile documenting and then reflecting on it what you think you have seen during implementation. The conclusion for me is that 
you know, if you want to do this, um, you know, of course, if I want to do this again, I would want to think much more carefully, how do we document even better rather than just the lock of all the things that happen, but actually much more maybe logging interpretations. Uh, so we had a very careful look of all the things that we did and, 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 and so on, but have interpretations already attached to it. So that's a little bit less biased in the way it is, even as a narrative story. But, but also to think very carefully from the beginning when you design things like this, as Liz also was saying, think of implementation. Implementation is the exciting part in some sense on some of these things and anything else. Then the other thing is that, you know, you learn quickly that various degrees of, you know, call it politics in the way the economy and politics and the civil service and the bureaucracy uh, interact clearly matter. So, so you need to think very carefully and probably you want, if you want to implement something, you know, some of these things we could have had as hypothesis beforehand, you know, what would be the things that we would be hitting and to actually state them much more carefully, even in our implementation, even not as a researcher, but even as an implementation. Uh, to lead to the final thing, you know, there never is, even in this seemingly highly technical area of tech, there never is a kind of something that you that you can do in isolation, uh, in isolation as it is just purely technical. You know, it is in the end... You step into bureaucratic politics, interests, um, political settlements. You step them all the time in it. And it um, makes it exciting and a little bit frustrating because you kind of wonder, you know, uh, to what extent was it worth it? I think, I think the glass is at least half full. There's some interesting things there. But actually, uh, you always wonder, should we have done this better and so on? And hopefully document this a little bit. Helps the next ones uh, to do this a bit better. So that's my contribution. Okay. Well, thank you very much. It's a real honor to be here and uh, participate in this uh, important event in, in honor of Benno Ndulu, who's a close friend and colleague for, for 35, 40 years. Um, and uh, uh, I, I do want to uh, say that you know, Benno was very much, as Liz and, and Stefan said, very much the intellectual driving force behind this volume. Uh, that said, my, my role, I, uh, Liz already mentioned that I was a, a member of the Pathways Commission, which uh, we produced a couple of uh, excellent reports. Uh, <laughs> I'm quoting her. Uh, uh, <laughs> Uh, I should also say, uh, and this may be uh, revealing too much, I was the anonymous peer reviewer for Oxford <laughs> University Press uh, for this volume. So they took my uh, comments into account. Um, but I think the, the, the important point about this book and the, and the toolkit was that when we produced the reports uh, from the Pathways Commission, even though they were excellent reports, there was a problem from the very beginning, which is when you write a global report, it's very difficult to figure out what individual countries should do. And yet the, the question was relevant for individual countries. Countries wanted to know what should we do about digital transformation and their issues of the, the, how much regulation they should have what kind of incentives for innovation. These are burning questions at the country level. And here we produce this broad global report with some interesting uh, lessons. And I was thinking it's, it's a little bit like, uh, you know, all these other reports that international organizations do, like the World Development Report and others, which some of us have, have written, let alone <laughs> uh, supervised. Um, and they all have suffer from that problem that they, by definition, are more general than something that the country uses. Now, like with the uh, World Development Reports, there's usually, and some of you probably experience this, there's usually a discussion when the report is published, which is let's operationalize the WDR. Uh, so let's let's actually make it country specific and let the country uh, uh, to figure out what the country can do. And this is where I think Benno's insight came in because Benno, we, I remember sitting with him and talking about it, saying, "Look, you know," he said, "Look, Shanta, we've been in this business for 40, 50 years. Can can we figure out a better way than just writing an operationalizing volume?" And I think he was absolutely right. And and it's for two reasons. One is. It, it, it's not for us, the, those who wrote the report, to figure out how it should be applied in the country. It's for the country to figure it out. But the other, and this is 
I think the most important lesson we, we, we should take away is, you know, policy doesn't get made by some policymaker reading a report on operationalizing <laughs> the, the, the process, right? It, it, it is a much more complex and, and difficult and messy uh, episode. And so you know, the, the, the reason they went ahead with this is to say, can we help that process along? That's, that's what we're trying to do. We're not trying to say, do this, do that. Um, we're not even trying to say, here's some, here's some evidence. Why don't you figure out what to do? But can we actually promote that process of decision making? And that we know that it's going to be a messy uh, process. And we find out that it doesn't work sometimes the, 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 way, we, uh, the way we intervene. So I think this is, this is a, a really important uh, way of of doing implementation, if you like, the, 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 the buzzword that everybody to throws around, but it's very different from the way we normally do it. Um, and I think that's uh, the, the, uh, the, the, real, the real value. Uh, I should also say that the other innovation is then having done it, having done this toolkit and, and, and diffused it uh, in uh, seven uh, countries, to then write about it and write about it with some honesty. Uh, that I, I, by the way, I don't think you should apologize that this is not a randomized control trial or the impact evaluation. I mean, this is this is much more useful than all of those randomized control trials that you and I have done in our in our youth, um, uh, right? Because this is. It, 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 and and it, this is important for the same people who who look at randomized control trials because what what's the point of doing an impact evaluation is you want you want a lesson you want to figure out well what should I do well this is another way of learning what you should do and maybe even what you shouldn't do uh, from uh, uh, from from this narrative so I think it's uh, it's it's a real contribution now then let me let me say see if there's things that we can. Uh, extract from this uh, for the next volume <laughs> or for, for people who want to follow up on this. One is, and really the nice thing about this is the description of the failure, the unnamed country. Um, but we can then go back and say, and there were some there were some glitches in some of the other countries too. So that's not, it's not like they were the others were perfect. Um, is there something we can learn from that in terms of how we design the, the next set of tool, the next generation of toolkits? Uh, and in particular, I think the, 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 the issue is how, how flexible you can be when you see things are going wrong. Um, uh, how, how, how much should you be able to change course um, if, if, if need be? Um, the, but then the, the final thing I would say is, the, the the and then the narrative uh what did you call it narrative economics narrative, yeah. Yeah, narrative. Uh, uh, it, what it tells us is also how external advisors should engage with the country um uh, or not should but what what happens in that process of external advisors engaging with the country and here too there are some good and bad uh, uh lessons to be learned uh i i would say um for instance, and you hear this in all fora, uh, that you know we want to support the champion of reform. We go find a champion for that reform, even if there's not much of a political consensus, but we will support the champion and help him or her to, to push it through. And that, you know, that was part of the strategy in the in the toolkit. Well, we saw what happened in the unnamed country, right? Uh, and by the way. I win. You know, I can think of a dozen countries, <laughs> and I won't name them, um, where this has happened in other contexts, not just digital. Uh, the the digital context. I, well, I'll name one. I mean, it, Zambia in 1991, when Chiluba was elected after you know, 20 years of Kaunda, the bank and the fund got so excited, and they literally the, the phrase was, "Oh, we now have a finance minister." whom we can talk to. And so they signed a whole bunch of structural adjustment loans uh, with that finance minister that included uh, May's price reform. And it turned out that that finance minister hadn't consulted with the cabinet before, 
going through with the structural adjustment program. And so, and maize price reform falls under the regime of the agricultural minister. The agricultural minister looks at it and said, I never agreed to this, forget it. And the deal was off and the, the, the loans were all canceled. Uh, a classic mistake that we make, we say we have a champion, right? Because we can talk to him, uh, usually because he went to the same schools as we did and, and things like that. Um, and uh, we fail to recognize that those champions may not have any political uh, 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 visibility in the, in, in, the, in the country. The other, and this is, we can discuss this, but, and, and I see that I, I gave a comment, not anonymously, that was actually quoted here, which is, what do you do when you find that, as we always, we frequently do, which is uh, when you run out of, when you think the country doesn't have the capacity, the bureaucratic capacity to, to do something. Uh, and so you make a judgment and say, oh, okay, they don't have the capacity. And by the way, that's true of a lot of countries. Um, even if you think those are the countries that might need the help the most. Right? And I think we should go back and say, well, maybe there's a problem with our model, right? I mean, maybe the model we're trying to uh, implement is too sophisticated for that country's capacity. Maybe we can simplify it or maybe we can tailor it in such a way that it suits the capacity. So instead of just throwing your hands up in the air and saying, there's not enough capacity, let's go back and look at ourselves and say, maybe we should be changing. Uh, and maybe we should be building the capacity to be more flexible with our models. Can I uh, then ask my good friend Chaguna to say a few words? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, and um, I'm very happy that um, I'm listening to this, and um, uh, I think uh, you can imagine the transformation we have gone through. Now, I'm listening to driving digital transformation. If I go back to the time when we started actually trying to sell the idea of uh, mobile phone-based financial transactions with Ben Onduru here, it was it was uh, one of the spring meetings. And now, I mean, the first spring meeting since I became the finance minister, you can imagine that time I was the first, uh, the, it was my first uh, spring meeting as a governor. And uh, because we were trying to experiment uh, that it can, we can actually have a mobile phone based financial transactions, uh, th then nobody could actually see it. And even the, 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 the spring meetings and even the subsequent, we went actually to three meetings, the spring meeting, the annual meeting, and even the following year, the spring meeting. And everybody was combining, the World Bank, the IMF, and the, even the US Treasury would combine to come and listen to this and see what is happening. And it was actually Beno and myself who were trying to actually convince everyone that it can work. You can imagine where we have come from. So now we can talk about digital transformation. In Kenya, for example, everything is actually digital transformation. Everything they talk about, government services, digitized, everything. So because it was taken up. So you can imagine how far we have come. But there's still resistance, as you're saying. Uh, uh, and I, I still remember when I left the central bank in 2015, before I found myself in Bravatnik again, I think we are all having the same kind of history. I, I was, uh, the Bill and Merida Gates Foundation sent me to Nigeria to try and talk to the governor to understand how this is working. But he did not even give me audience, but they didn't give up. I still also went to the, se the second time. But uh, I think the second time we had a fireside chat and all that. But at the end of the day, as you say, the, you rightly said, the, the, political, the, the political maneuvering about a new issue is always quite problematic. For me in Kenya, uh, the Ministry of Finance could not oppose it, but they said if it fails, it's for the central bank. They let them swim through it. But I think there were three selling points then. First, this is a retail electronic payments platform. And if you get it right, actually it can be a game changer. And we, we, we thought that is a, it's a, a, a neutral statement, but it was a very, very powerful statement. I think I saw papers written uh, that showed that actually uh, it was the first World Bank uh, discussion paper that showed that it is actually uh, transparent and it's safe and it's real time and changed the whole landscape. The second thing we also now sold in subsequent years with Beno was actually to show that, look, most of the time we did not go into the banking sector 
because essentially it was so difficult for the banking sector to manage micro accounts, small accounts. And all of a sudden, the banks discovered that there's a technological platform here which actually can manage micro accounts. And all of a sudden, it was like a fire. That's the time now the theme of financial inclusion became very, very important. And for us, everything else was becoming quite, quite clear cut. And we are now became even more strong in terms of advocating that as a policy and even a policy design or even a strategy. And the third one was actually saying, look, when I joined the central bank in 2007, the first thing was to check, oh, look at how much currency outside the banking sector. Then my question to my colleagues in the central bank was, then how do you influence? How does monetary policy work if this is the case? But what we also saw that after that was that massive currency coming back into the banking system because the mobile phone itself was actually an account in the banking sector. And from then, from then, a whole host of things. I still recall that uh, I argued the Kenyan case in the FATF in Paris that having an electronic payments platform like M-Pesa is actually going to improve our AML CFT regime. And they do not see how, especially I think there was a country in there, I should name it, Namibia was actually saying, you are in trouble because of this M-Pesa because it must be um, uh, rounding money. And I argued that we can actually monitor transactions. We even had a threshold of transactions. And that became quite clear that it was working very well. In fact, because you mentioned that point, we realized that even the last time Kenya was hit by terrorism, they were all caught because you could monitor the transactions. Today, you haven't had any kind of terrorist attack in Kenya for the last, I think, almost uh, seven years now, because you realize that even using uh, this, uh, the, the, even financing terrorism can be mapped up very well. So essentially, it's a positive tool, but even gets used in different corners. And, and it's fantastic in its own light. But then all hosts of other things have come up since then. This IMF book in 2017 that argued that digital transformation is going to change the design of public finance. So in a sense, what we are seeing is that there's a whole family of benefits that are coming up. It's becoming much easier now to sell the product. So I'm very happy that uh, my colleague, my late colleague uh, and, and, and mentor for me, he was a mentor for me, has really, his, his ideas are still living. We even pushed even to have a, 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 um, a study uh, supported by Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation to make sure that ARC keeps these ideas alive. And Tita is uh, part of that group. I'm sorry I had to leave AERC six months ago just because, again, I mean this. But you can imagine those ideas keep going. So I'm very happy that this is coming, um, coming up. We are actually seeing that we do not have to argue with other countries in terms of uh, where things are happening. And I do believe if I have a suspicion about the, the country that is not yet named, we do believe it's the dominance of banks that felt like, look, it is eating our, this this product is eating our lunch. But in Kenya, for example, in the East African region, we showed the banks that actually it is not eating your lunch. It's actually improving the quality and quantity of your lunch. And they got it. And today, nobody argues with it, especially the, the multinational and, region and Pan-African banks. They, they felt that this was eating our lunch. Now they have realized this is improving our lunch. It's very happy. I'm very happy about this because it's going to improve the takeaway in terms of policy paradigm. I'm seeing that even now, the debate is now going into the for the industrial revolution using the digital evolution that is taking place. You can see that the ideas are improving. So I'm very happy about this. Thank you very much for this chance. Thank you. Well, one of yeah. Sorry, and, and here, do, you, do you have anything you want to add? while you're on the screen. Um, so we were talking um, about you, you earlier and we said you were a protagonist in the books. <laughs> I see, but thank you. And thank you, Stefan. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, sorry that I'm out there in person. I actually got stuck in another meeting uh, and then I have another meeting coming up just after this. So uh, thank you for allowing me to speak uh, virtually. But uh, again, uh, congratulations to Liz uh, and Stefan for the book. 
and uh, thank you for uh, so articulately capturing the journey of uh, Bangladesh and how the toolkit really helped. Uh, maybe I'll just take a couple of minutes to uh, points that I think are quite important uh, as we are talking about the digital transformation of nations, not not companies, not uh, enterprises, but at, at, at the national level and potentially at the global level. I think a few points that I want to bring up. Number one is the whole of government education. I think the toolkit really helped us. Uh, we had this... Uh, I see that came up there, a few hundred, uh, forty plus uh, actions. Uh, I'm there. sorry, you are breaking up. Um, do you want to try turning your 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 uh, screen Video. off? Maybe that will help. Sure, yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, is it is it better? Yes. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. So I'll make just a few points. Uh, the first one I wanted to make is the whole of government execution uh, towards digital transformation. That's absolutely key. Uh, the toolkit really helped us uh, understand what that whole of government execution meant. We had an ICT policy uh, with uh, 340 plus action items, but many of these action items were in silo. And I think when we used the toolkit and looked at it uh, through the lens and through the, some of the uh, uh, the discussions, brainstorming, surveys that we did uh, for the toolkit. I think we were able to look at it from a whole of government perspective and also uh, prioritize those hundreds of action items. So which come first and which would actually give us a cascading effect. So instead of doing some of the, uh, I would say, uh, items that are not going to create a cascading effect, we focus on the ones that would create the cascading effect. I think that was very important. The second important thing I wanted to uh, bring up is operationalizing the political will. So I think that's a very important thing. We talk about political will uh, all the time, but what does political will will mean in the context of a country? Uh, Bangladesh was fortunate because the prime minister announced the concept of a digital Bangladesh in 2008 to be achieved by 2021, the 50th anniversary of the country's birth. So that allowed us to sort of unify. Uh, and uh, I think we were able to figure out how to take the prime minister's message uh, throughout the bureaucracy, uh, obviously within the cabinet, but also with the permanent secretaries down to the level of DGs of agencies, to the level of heads of districts and the heads of sub-districts. So how you actually operationalize the political will and create a sense of urgency and sense of unification uh, and a culture of innovation within civil service. That's something that we experimented with. And I think uh, the book actually talks about some of that. Uh, the third uh, item that I wanted to bring up is the concept of a digital public infrastructure, something that uh, uh, we're all discussing. Actually, I was just uh, uh, in a, at Gates Foundation this morning uh, talking about digital public infrastructure and how it has helped us uh, bring different ID systems together and also different uh, payment systems together. So ID and payments and data and uh, services and access. These are the five layers of a DPI that we are working on in Bangladesh called the Inclusive Digital Transformation Stack, IDX Stack. So I think that's a very key element from an architectural, from a data sharing uh, from a security and also a whole of government approach for how we build uh, DPIs, digital public infrastructure. Just a couple of weeks ago, I was in uh, Washington, D.C. at another uh, roundtable focused on DPI, uh, organized by World Bank, uh, Gates Foundation, and USAID, where we talked about what DPIs really mean in the context of nations. So what does it mean in the context of the developed nation? What does it mean in the context of the developing nation? And can there be multiple definitions, multiple concepts? So I talked about the, the planners versus searchers concept that William Easterly talks about. So in a lot of the cases, when we talk about infrastructure, we think about a planner's approach that somebody will actually plan and create a prescription and everybody will follow that. In the case of Bangladesh digital transformation in the last uh, decade and a half or so, a very rapid one, an accelerated one, we saw that the searcher's approach was very useful. So we allowed uh, different types of innovations within different uh, ministries, uh, sometimes even through public-private partnerships. And then we are combining that into a, 
uh, into a whole that we're calling the IDX stack. So that uh, issue of experimentation to create the DPI, uh, the search for processing is going to be very, very important. The fourth point I want to bring up is the issue of incentives within the service for innovation. And this is a uh, topic of open and uh, uh, Liz fun discussed this quite a bit. And I don't have a specific answer. In Bangladesh, we tried many different things to create incentives. Some of it had to do with uh, uh, performance evaluation. Some of it had to do with rewards and recognition at the end of the year by the prime minister in terms of innovation awards. Some of it had to do with uh, creating innovation fund to support uh, brilliant innovations from civil service to try to land records, to try to digitize ID systems, to try to digitize uh, passports. Very critical services that were analog before, but uh, the uh, the digital design came from civil servants in collaboration with the demand side, in collaboration with citizens. So there's a lot of design thinking that went into it. We ran for six to seven years uh, a methodology called empathy training that we adapted from Stanford Design School, where we had mystery shopping, where we had actually uh, civil servants going to, uh, to different each other's offices uh, uh, and finding out what's wrong with this current service delivery model. So a lot of uh, interesting incentive structure that we created, but we don't have one answer around that. And we're trying to form create a formula, create a, uh, we have created a culture of innovation in Bangladesh civil service in a matter of a decade plus, but now we're trying to institutionalize that. And that's where I think we need uh, guidance uh, from scholars from Oxford and other, other organizations such as maybe uh, CGD as well. And the fifth and the last one I want to make is the issue of digital divide. Uh, in Bangladesh, uh, for, the, for the first uh, decade or so, before COVID came around, uh, we were working on the assumption that we did not have a lot of digital divide in Bangladesh because we created these thousands of digital centers across the country, which are access points. Uh, about six to seven million people go to these centers every month to access uh, services when they don't have access from their homes or of their, of, of their workplaces. Uh, because they don't have the right device, they cannot pay for data, they don't have the skills. But what we saw during COVID is that we were leaving out very important pockets behind. And now we are working on this uh, uh, report called Equality Through E-Quality, where we're looking at uh, not only the digital issues, but also the power asymmetry that exists in society that in a way exacerbates either digital adoption or digital divide. So you either you get better adoption or you get uh, worse divides uh, if you don't design the services properly. So that's also a very important aspect of digital service design, adoption, and uh, development of capacity within the service providers and also within the service seekers. So those are the five things I just wanted to, wanted to bring up uh, in context of this uh, brilliant book. But I think this book uh, will really uh, enlighten policymakers in many different countries. This captures uh, seven countries, but I think it uh, tells the tales of uh, many countries which are in this shared journey of what we call digital transformation uh, to towards uh, SDG achievement and also towards socioeconomic progress in all uh, developing countries. Thank you very much for this opportunity to, to let me speak. Thank you. Um, and now uh, we, we only have sort of eight or nine minutes left, but some time uh, uh, within the room for, 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 for questions, discussion. Does anybody want to? Thank you. Um, my name is Daniel Rangel. I'm the research director of a group based here in this is called Rethink Trade. Uh, so I'm a lawyer. I come from a different perspective on all of these issues, and particularly I work a lot on digital trade. And I was very interested in the um, description of the of this presentation because it raised some kind of tension between this idea of bridging the digital divide, uh, aiming for a digital transformation, but without for developing countries succumbing in a way to multi multinational monopolies. And I was wondering if we can find out um, a little bit more of on the policy tools that the countries that you studied used to try to balance this problem 
uh, particularly in the context of digital trade negotiations in which a lot of these different policy tools that countries like, for instance, Kenya has been using, like data localization requirements, are being limited, if not proscribed. Uh, so uh, I'm interested in, in that part of the conversation in case you can give us some thoughts. Um, well, that's a, that's, a, that's a very good question. And uh, so, of course, we were working with quite a lot of different countries and, and where they were with this, this issue was uh, quite diverse. But, but it, it was interesting that um, one, of the, one of the last papers that Ben also was working on was all about between a comparison between countries on digital taxation. And he got very worked up by this whole idea that, you know, because it moves, we can tax it, so to speak. You know, we suddenly, we can see these data. As you say, it's easily monitorable. So everywhere there were transaction taxes being being introduced. He also considered, and I, I would agree with it, but I'm, I'm, I'm very keen to hear maybe Njuguna actually thinking about it as seen from Kenya. The, he was very concerned with this kind of response of kind of protectionism around it all, yeah. So, so he 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 was very concerned, and I think I would would agree with that. And that we see these moves in countries um, on data localization to go um, very naively uh, about it. You know, if I can stop it, I'll stop it. And the things I can stop, I'll stop. And then I'm not having a strategic governance view on it, if you see what I mean. So, so there was, um, and in a sense. In the work we had built in, there were conversations on that, and and uh, you know the as um, as as we had designed it was to try to say okay this has to be a kind of a whole of government thing, and you can't ignore topics, so you can't ignore the governance topic. But um, I think what we experienced is that several of the places where we're dealing with. We didn't get that far, so to speak. Uh, we didn't get that far because actually the basic governance, like I was describing in, in Ethiopia, where you didn't even have digital payments properly sorted, why would there be a proper conversation on that? And in, in fact, the countries that had called us in weren't quite there. So there is something, I think, in the book as well, a little bit on it and in some of the papers that we wrote beforehand, is that it's just this whole idea is like, you know, if you're going to start thinking about data localization and taxation and the relationship with all these things, is that um, try to get a comprehensive policy view on it. Because, you know, with all the things that we are looking at with, um, you know, with the, the pressures on traditional forms of economic transformation, that actually, look, if we, if we don't allow for... Um, the setup of digital trade as one possibility, you know, whether it's e-services, exports, or or the trade in it, we're just going to lose out in in the opportunities because you know data localization policies at some point, it's more than governance. It's 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 some obsession with thinking that you can be our talk a party on some of these things as well. So so I don't know whether you want to add but this. Just to add that regulation was one of the pillars yeah. that we were looking at in the digital economy kit. So it certainly wasn't that we were ignoring it. Although as you say, Benno was very very much of a kind of let's do it and then the regulation will come afterwards. Yeah. He thought that there was um, it was more dangerous for countries to try to not develop their digital economies uh, than to, to, to be left behind yeah. than it was to go ahead and do it and then maybe a little bit post hoc think about regulatory issues. But that's not to deny the importance of them. A absolutely to the contrary. And as I say, one of the four pillars that they Kit looked at was it was exactly that regulation, but in the context of what are we, to what ends, what what's the purpose of this? What are we what are we trying to achieve with an overall strategy? Yeah, 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 and and you're right. I think the two things that have emerged, which are very very strong, so so on. Yeah. Okay, I think two things that have come come up. I think um, one of them is actually. There's massive data being generated by this uh, uh, digital transformation. And uh, the new debate that is coming up is actually, <laughs> how do we actually deal with um, data policy and data governance? Because it's touching on, on so many of these aspects. And, and that, for me, is, is a developing, it's actually a work in progress, and that may define what we really need to do in the future. The second one is that we are 
arrive to the fact that uh, it's a booming sector, and obviously the government would like to tax a, a, boom, a booming sector. But the biggest problem is that there is a thin line between, I and mean, you can create a disincentive, and everybody, like for example, in Kenya, in the last ten years, all of a sudden. People are now transacting more and more in cash. When you look at the dad data because of the characteristic of the people who are in this digital platform, you find that the median transactor has not actually changed. We use the median transactor to actually comp compose payments across. And we found that those people who are above the median should actually compensate those who are below. The moment you introduce the tax system, then you find that most people are running away. And so it means that there is, there is a bit of work that we really needs to do to, to, to understand what is really happening here. I'm one of those people who has been really opposed to saying, look, make, even if you do have to tax, make sure that you don't create that uh, wedge that most people start preferring cash. And that is the, the biggest problem. But the tax system also wants to understand what are you doing in the transactions. And this is where the, is creating fear. And I've told uh, everyone that, uh, look, if we create fear, we are actually going to kill what we really needed to do. For example, there is nothing that happens in Kenya without uh, a digital platform. Even in e-services, you want a passport, you want a driving license, you want any service that you want in the government, you go to the platform. So you can imagine if you create a wedge that you are also observing uh, what hap what's happening without a proper, I think it's not, the problem is not observing what are the rules of the game that we need to observe. And that is something that we need to care about. Who was talking about data, data related risks from issues that are growing. And a lot of people are now losing trust in the digital, um, in digital financial services. So what does this mean for the ordinary person, especially the low income earners in developing countries? What is being done maybe to mitigate some of these risks? How can we make the digital transformation work for such people? Hi, uh, I'm Tarek Kokar of the Wellcome Trust in the UK. Chanda, uh, you mentioned the need for politically connected champions. And I'm curious in the book whether you also see a need for having a sufficient breadth of digitally savvy bureaucrats um, to make these things work. And to give you um, just two kind of examples, one, uh, Omar uh, bin Sultan, who was appointed the Minister of AI in Saudi Arabia a couple of years back, and may actually have done this with, with you guys at Blavatnik, he sent his top team to Oxford for uh, four months uh, before he even got going, saying, please you know, notify these people before they come and uh, work, work in government. And then you have initiatives like um, teaching public service in a digital age by David Eves and co the Kennedy School, which is effectively a master's program for the modern civil servant to bring them up to speed, to, you know, know their arse from their elbow um, in, in all this stuff. So I'm just, again, curious, uh, what's the importance of that you know, layer of knowledge to, to these endeavors? Thanks. All right, I'll be, I'll be really quick. Um, so absolutely, completely agree. And in fact, that was, we don't have the answers in the book. We don't try and, and pretend to have the answers, but listening to the voice of the consumer um, and the user, as well as the private sector, as well, the provider, the startup, the bureaucrat, that was central to this idea of having a multi-stakeholder dialogue so so that was again very much part of Benno's thinking and the design of this process was to out those views um totally agree I, my my response to your question Tariq would be you want as broad a base of bureaucrats who understand this as possible and we discovered as well you need to go down into the bureaucracy as well so in Ethiopia kind of afterwards we had a meeting with you know Dr Yob the Minister of Finance was a huge champion of this lower down in the in the bureaucracy there was a lot of concern um you know not least more junior civil servants they, their job incentives may not be set up to allow for this kind of innovation so i think having a cadre of people across government who are championing it is is absolutely the way to go and the rest of my minute i would just say that we um the book in the is available in the us from the end of this month it's available for the UK now, but you can also download it for free and we'll show the, U the QR code, I think, at the end. John, then, quick. Yeah, just, just very quick. Just um, despite a bit of the work also, the background related to the, to the Commission's work. So the website in, in Oxford is still still there with the things. 
because some of the things that you discussed, you know, this is not necessarily what we documented, and a lot to do with it related to that earlier answer is that often countries were not that far, but the things were recognized. But this work, and of course, it is, it is seen very much as, as this issue, and the same actually applies to this kind of knowledge and, and coherence uh, thing. And, and in fact, you know, Oxford also does uh, lots of courses these days on, on doing it, not just at, uh, at Hunt. Um, <laughs> but but uh, there are the, there, there are the things to be done, and it's actually interesting. Uh, and the one area that we definitely came out with our work, I can quickly add to it, is that the risk side, the kind of broader cybersecurity side, the risk side from, 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 from personal risk to all sorts of things, we noticed in all the countries we worked in how it totally was underestimated. And in fact, one of the follow-ups in Oxford as a research program is actually entirely focused now on the cybersecurity broadly defined, because that seems to be where the least capacity is present, because everybody gets enthusiastic, and then that's part. So it's not just consumer risk, but actually much broader. Well, uh, thank you. Um, Benno, as well as being just a, a wonderful human being, was a fantastic uh, uh, acme of, of being a scholar practitioner. And I think this is the, the kind, of, kind of work that comes from that. So congratulations all. Uh, good luck with the book event. Thank you, everybody uh, in the room. And thank you, everybody online. And only eight minutes late. Uh, thanks. <laughs>